pictured this in a studio somewhere far, far away. The question on everyone's lips is, of course, why does Robert Smith of The Cure always get Stevie Wonder to put his lipstick on? <laughs> Britain's schools are seldom out of the news. Only last week a new report showed a sharp decline in the standard of reading. This may be connected <laughs> to the alarming shortage of teachers who are so badly paid that large numbers of them are leaving to go into better paid professions such as nursing or doing a paper round. <laughs> Maths teachers are in particularly short supply. This is because they are able to work out exactly how poor they're going to be. Small wonder that in recent years we have seen the increasing threat of an all-out strike by teachers. What do we want? 12%! 12 how do we get it? We, we divide, divide the whole sum by 100 and multiply by 12 to get the percentage. Now get on with exercise 4 on page 130. The situation is getting worse. The government's idea of a teacher's shortage is when the House of Commons bar runs out of whiskey. <laughs> the media also traditionally finds teachers difficult to deal with. Here at the National Conference, I have with me Giles Garrett from the NUT. So, Mr Garrett, have you and your colleagues definitely decided to go on strike, or do you hold out hopes of arbitration? <laughs> is the cameraman chewing? <laughs> Are you chewing? Well, someone is. Right, come on, or the entire camera crew will stay here. I've got plenty of time. <laughs> One thing I've noticed about teachers is that they've always got names like Mr Pratt or Miss Shufflebottom, right? <laughs> and this is because they're the kind of people who think, oh yeah, I'll go into teaching. There's a profession in which my name will escape ridicule. <laughs> Worse still, there's always one chummy teacher who thinks he knows what his nickname is and will talk about it to your dad at a parent-teacher association function. Well, my name's uh, Morse, so they call me Inspector. Could be worse, I suppose. <laughs> oh, I see, it must be some other Morse my son calls Mr Embryo Head, then. <laughs> there was also always one teacher you were a bit scared of, although you never knew quite why. I'm afraid Hutchinson has not done his homework. <laughs> what a pity. We do not tolerate failure in this organisation. <laughs> Kenneth Clark there. <laughs> At school, the most important thing, though, is the rules, and even minor misdemeanours are always treated very seriously. Tonight we begin with a highly dangerous crime which has shown an alarming increase in recent weeks. The scene, the corridor outside the staff room. Last Thursday morning, on their way to French, two third years were spotted running. <laughs> Our hidden surveillance cameras also spotted this boy graffitiing the word bollocks on the side of a fellow pupil's Adidas bag. <laughs> he is also wanted on two counts of writing Mr Hinchcliffe is a bender on the board of the benches and for failing to sew his name tag on the outside of his gym shorts. <laughs> Here with me is Chief Superintendent Marsh of the Regional Crime Squad. This really is an alarming sequence of crimes, is it not? Well, yes, indeed. Uh, this is very, very serious. Uh, we may, of course, be sitting on a time bomb. However, we are very heartened. We've had a number of calls in concerning the talking in assembly <laughs> and the wearing of grey v-neck sweaters with a higher acrylic wool mix than is specified in regulations. I understand you also have the treasure trove of confiscated school items to show us. Yes, indeed. In the treasure trove this week, we have uh, several pencil cases. Uh, someone might recognise this distinctive ink blots down here at the bottom. Uh, a Super Bowl and this rather old and dog-eared copy of Mayfair. Oh no, that's mine. <laughs> Aside from academic work, you also get to do games. This means getting undressed in front of a lot of people of the same sex. And in the case of boys, 
This means having to cope with the fact that one of the other boys will be prodigiously developed. Not just for a young boy, but for a mammoth. <laughs> also, at my school, if you had forgotten your swimming kit, they made you do it in the nuddy. Now, honestly, school is supposed to be a preparation for life. Ron Pickering. And a setback for Britain's Duncan gives you in the 100 metres butterfly final. He's forgotten his trunks. And the Olympic Federation have ruled that he's got to do it in the nutty. Imagine if they extended this regulation. There was uproar in the Commons today when Chancellor Norman Lamont arrived for his budget speech without his briefcase. So we had to do it in the nutty. <laughs> the Speaker said it was the worst thing he'd ever seen in the House of Commons. <laughs> The school changing room atmosphere is something that some men carry on into later life. You see businessmen after squash talking with complete equanimity about business, as if they were both not in the nuddy. For some people, this is why a career in business is frankly impossible. Well, Rob, great game, good shower. Now, I say we should go with Bolivian zinc. There's been a lot of movement on Wall Street, and it looks to me like the whole damn thing could be a winner. What do you say? I can see you're fishy. I between my legs and do an impression of a girl. <laughs> I see. I can offer you a good job at Polly Peck. Now, Essex Police would like information concerning a particularly gruesome murder after the body of Mr. Armitage Stepanik of Kentish Town was found in two black bin liners. His head had been cut off and a pigeon stuffed in his mouth. If you know anything at all about this murder, please phone the Crime Stoppers number and you could win a Community Action Trust reward. Which brings us to good news. This week's Community Action Trust reward for information leading to the arrest of an East End gang boss goes to a Mr. Armitage Stepanik of Kentish Town. Congratulations. And now, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome the Happy Mondays. <laughs> yippee, yippee, yay, yay, yay. Don't you think I look like Peter Beardsley? <laughs> Excuse me. What do I pay you for, exactly? <laughs> and now, the embarrassment experience. Embarrassment is a modern condition of being. In history, it seems people were simply never embarrassed. The Lord Nelson is hit! He lies dying! My Lord, has England's greatest admiral one last request? Kiss me. Hardy. I'm sorry. Kiss me, Hardy. Uh, well, I would, but I'm not really that way inclined. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, I've got nothing Oh, else. come on, Hardy, don't be so uptight. Just a little peck. Not a Frenchie. Oh, all right. Mouth open, but no tongue. Um, it's my one arm, isn't it? No, no, no. I've no. seen you looking that two-armed fellow down in midships. No, 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 don't you? Go on, Hardy! Snoke, Snoke, Snoke! Snow. Oh, right, oh. right. The truth is, my heart is already given to another. And every night, I await their call across the waters. Uh -huh, my heart is... Pugwash! <laughs> Today, though, you're embarrassed just walking down the high street, particularly if you trip over the pavement. When people trip over, they always pretend they haven't. They sort of incorporate a hop, skip and jump into their walk for the rest of the day. Well, like, I don't know if this happens to you, right? Sometimes I'm just walking down the high street and, like, and you suddenly find yourself walking stride for stride, level with an old lady. So, like, you speed up so people won't think your best friend is someone who owns a tartan zip-up shopping trolley. <laughs> but, like, she's sped up as well because she's frightened of you, so you both end up bombing neck and neck down the road at 30 miles an hour. <laughs> The modern meaning of the word, as in to feel uncomfortably self-conscious, was not present in the old word, embarrass, which simply meant to hinder, as in the phrase, to embarrass Napoleon's forces. But we may have got this wrong. Sir General, what news of Wellington and the English? Mon Empereur, the English are currently in the field erecting their new weapon. Aha, it does not frighten me. What is it? 
A giant catapult? A cannon? No. It is a huge photo of you when you were five years old. Oh, no. Not the one with me wearing the shirt with the huge collar. Oui, mon empereur. And the kipper tie. Oh, no. I look like the lead singer of Mutt at Peter Sarstedt's wedding reception. Mon empereur, the English are raising their flag. Oh, no. That is no flag. That is a pair of my own soiled underpants. Oh, no. What? Yes. The ones with do not disturb on the front. <laughs> Look, I can explain the skid marks. I was on horseback all the way from Moscow. <laughs> How will future generation of French people remember this day? Well, it gets covered in 1974 by Amber, with the single Waterloo for Rapido. <laughs> What a tosser. <laughs> we must never forget the very useful social function that tramps perform, sabotaging street theatre and making it entertaining. And the same with busking. No matter how well the busker sings Annie's song, the only thing which brings the crowds flocking is when the passing tramp, out of the goodness of his heart, joins in. In fact, this is such a guarantee of success, one wonders why John Denver didn't use a tramp on the original recording. Okay, cue John. You fill up my senses Like the night in a forest Cue my Jack McClafferty. You fill up my senses but how does anyone become a tramp? They themselves are always saying, well, I had a bit of bad luck. But if I have a bit of bad luck, if, for example, I go to the newsagent and it's shut, I don't go straight over to the bin and think, oh, I wonder if there's some food in there, and then not go home for 27 years. But back to tramps and the arts. Tramps do occasionally perform solo. This is because the vagrancy laws class begging as a criminal offence, but not busking. So many tramps allow themselves a very loose definition of busking. Cancer! Sire! I'll take you all on, I'll kill the copper and steam you, I did. And later on we'll be playing some more Bob Dylan. <laughs> According to tramps, busking consists entirely of putting your cap on the floor. Then they'll shout, dance, have a brain hemorrhage, and expect to be paid for it. Some of them seem to think that having a bit of snot hanging out of your nose counts as performance art. <laughs> this, I think, is why so many of them hang around the South Bank in London. They're hoping to be spotted and put on at the Royal Festival Hall. Hello and welcome to the Royal Festival Hall for the premiere performance of this recently updated version of The Beggar's Opera. In Act One, Mad Jack McClafferty comes on and shouts for a long time about how his hands are deadly weapons and don't you forget it. Until, in a moment of supreme irony, a member of the audience gets up to get an ice cream and he panics and runs away. <laughs> Act two is taken up mainly with a long nap on top of his lifelong friend Jerry, who he met last week. <laughs> During this time, Mad Jack breaks the record for the most fluid ounces of urine ever to emerge from a single trouser leg. <laughs> there then follows a long soliloquy on the subject of the Germans, although I can't be sure it might have been about how his marriage broke up and someone called Norm didn't pay him. The central theme remains, however, consistent. His hands are deadly weapons, and don't you forget it. And then the grand finale. Isolde is dead, Tristan laments, and Mad Jack has a bit of snot hanging out of his nose. British are traditionally not known for their cuisine, although this stereotype is no longer true, as was shown last year in the BBC series MasterChef. However, the message hasn't yet reached all sections of the population. Hello, welcome to the semi-final of Student MasterChef, and let's have a look at our three contestants' menus. Dave from Sheffield Poley is starting with toast, 
followed by a main course of toast and marmite, and for dessert, toast and three-year-old strawberry jam we found at the back of the larder. John from Brighton Pooley has hors d'oeuvre of cornflakes with St. Ivel five pints as he's run out of milk, followed by far too much chili con carne with badly burned rice, and to finish, that yogurt he bought in Marseille while interrailing. Graham from Oxford has chosen to start with ten pints of lager. <laughs> then pigeon breast marinated in port with walnut and radicchio in a Provencal dressing and finishing with a collection of sexist rugby songs and copious vomiting. <laughs> Eating out has apparently become more popular over the last ten years, despite the fact that for those who don't eat out much, advertising seems to do its level best to try and confuse them. Uh, can I have uh, the steak with chips? Uh, I'd like that lobster that sings about what credit cards you take, please. <laughs> All advertising of food is a bit weird, because, like, the only slogan you've really got is food, eat it, or you die. <laughs> this leads to all sorts of desperate image-making, like trying to make us think that Weetabix is a hard cereal, a thug in the breakfast bowl. Well, let's see just how hard a Weetabix really is. <coughs> What a puff. Anyway, <laughs> other countries have different attitudes towards food, and many British visitors are shocked when they realise that in France, it's quite common to find restaurants which specialise in horse meat. Garçon, what do you recommend from this menu? I recommend the pepper steak, trained by Gaston Leroux, owned by Anne-Marie Leclerc. The going is good to medium rare, chump chop, worth the risk at current prices, and of course, T-bone, today's favourite. How long is all this going to take to cook? Chump chop ready at 10 to 1, T-bone at 5 to 1, and they're away and onto the grill, and it's chump chop on the left with sausages on the right, and as they come into the first turn, in goes the spatula, and chump chop has fallen, chump chop has fallen, and that leaves sausages, uh, sausages that have been in the fridge for three weeks, and they're off. Italian food is very popular. You can always tell an Italian restaurant by the fact that there will be a picture of the 1982 Italian World Cup squad on the wall. And underneath the words, Campione del Mondo, which is Italian for didn't win the last two times. <laughs> Non-Italian pizza restaurants brings us to the question of the salad bar. OK, sirs, if you'd like to help yourself to the salad bar, you'll find a selection of plastic trays half full of rather manky vegetables. <laughs> and do note the skilful way in which the bits of sweet corn have managed to get into all of them. <laughs> then there's the choice of salad dressings, that's French, Thousand Island or blue cheese, that's the oily one, the one that looks like sick, and the one that looks like semen. <laughs> what about fish and chip shops? How do these traditional British institutions keep going in the face of increased competition? Well, we take the very finest fresh cod, then we say this is far too expensive and put it back, <laughs> buy a couple of old North Sea bus pass cases, dip them in two coats of Dulux vinyl emulsion and fry them for four hours in pure castro. <laughs> uh, do you want a five-year-old can of Fanta? You know, with the old logo. <laughs> it's very difficult to get it right with waiters. Some of them seem to specialise in making you feel totally inferior. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you recommend? I recommend you try and look less poor, sir. <laughs> Have you ever been to a harvester before? <laughs> Generally speaking, however, waiters do get a hard time, and none more so than the ones that work in Indian restaurants, where the customers always behave in the same way. Yeah, to start, I want far too many poppadoms, and then a main course I'm too full to eat. I'd like the Vindaloo to show how hard I am. Uh, I'd like to be the one who at some point says, you know, they never actually eat this sort of food in India. Right, I'll be the one who orders fried chicken, chips and peas then. <laughs> uh, and I want the Vindaloo so hot that you all have to watch me sweating a lot on my upper lip and then I can make a really unfunny joke about going to the toilet tomorrow morning. <laughs> you know, they never actually eat this sort of food in India. Oh. <laughs> Tonight, we examine the question which is on the lips of the nation. Why is the England cricket team so crap? I mean, it's supposed to be our national sport, the sound of leather against willow, or in England's case, the sound of willow against air. I mean, what is the cause of our cricketing demise? We had a hidden camera in the Australian dressing room just before the last game. OK, we're going to slip swing on the backward short stump with a couple of early bounces. Let's go, Australia! Go, Australia! Go, go, go! 
Meanwhile, in the England dressing room, just run through it again, they throw the ball at me. No, no, they bowl the ball at you. No, you've lost me. Like this. <laughs> All right, ready? <laughs> Meanwhile, in the commentary box, the job of the pundits is to resist the knee-jerk reaction of the press and public and provide a more thoughtful and a more considered analysis. And what a completely crap performance we have seen by England today. Let's run through the scores. Australia, in their first innings, scored 214 off the first over and went on to score 796 before declaring that England were crap at bowling. <laughs> then England went in. The opening pair, Gooch and Larkins, were both crap. Atherton came in, looked promising, and then was crap. <laughs> Robin Smith came in, took a middle stump guard, looked fiercely determined, and then was crap. <laughs> By this time, England were on 19 for four. Australia then brought on two new bowlers, Madge from Neighbours <laughs> and a small koala bear called Timmy, <laughs> both of whom wreaked havoc on the England batsmen. And so it went on. Two England players went for a duck, another was bowled by a duck, and the rest just ran away in embarrassment. From now on, it's been announced that MCC will stand for massively crap cricketers. <laughs> My granddad actually died the other day on the occasion of his 92nd birthday. It was a great shame as we were only halfway through giving him the bumps. <laughs> now, although getting old is an unqualified disaster, TV is always trying to cosy it up with things like Dennis Norden's reflective, wry and astonishingly unfunny epithets on programmes like Looks Familiar. You, you know you're getting old and your secretary asks you to play around and you say, I'll just get out my gun. Oh no, one of the contestants has just died. In fact, looking familiar is the opposite of what actually happens to your body as it gets old. <laughs> the only way to avoid the ageing process is to be one of the eternal heroes of fiction. Oh, do pay attention, 007. Now, what you do with this device is you strap it in here, you pull back this little white lever, and the whole thing just takes off. I seek you and uh, watch it go out. A Ronco stair lift. <laughs> the reality of aging, in fact, is the one thing show business never confronts. Ladies and gentlemen, old Blue Eyes is old! Start spreading the plastic sheeting I'm coming to stay If I can make it up the stairs I might not piss in my pants I'm gonna wake up in the middle of the night and shout nurse no. Not only old, but death. Um, now, let me leave you with one final Mr. Norden, thought. You... I've told you not to take this away from the foot of your bed. <laughs> death, of course, eventually comes to us all, but fortunately, most of us will avoid the indignity of having our obituary on the news. And finally tonight, Tony McNockety, the actor whose face became known to millions as Ron Scribble in the Wimsdale Diaries, as, as I'm sure you've all gathered by now from the number of sub-clauses in this sentence and the fact that my voice drops at the end of each of them just before each comma on the auto queue, died H74. You knew it was coming. Why else would an actor's face pop up on the little screen behind me? And there's usually a graph or a picture of John Major. Our arts correspondent has been desperately rubbishing around for some good clips. Of course, the media have to be very careful how they treat bereavements, according to the deceased, all official decorum. This is a bit of a shame, as the media ought to reflect the way the public tend to see things. And finally tonight, Tony McNockety, you know that bloke who was what's it in thingy, has <laughs> snuffed it. Gosh, I didn't know he was still alive. He pegged out years ago. But he left a tidy packet. I wonder what he died of. Well, these actors, you have to wonder. <laughs> I suppose after the news, I'll be showing one of his old films instead of the snooker. Martin Amis said,
time goes about its immemorial work of making everyone look and feel like shit. And the proof of this is how unbearable it would be to imagine a reverse, this is your life, like before it's all happened to you. Well, David, you're 13 years old now and you're happy? Yes, very happy, thank you, Michael. Well, when you're 43, you will hear this voice. Mr. Baddiel, we've got the x-rays back and I'm afraid it's cancer. <laughs> but don't worry, because two years earlier, you receive a piece of sensational good news. Mr. Baddiel, you're completely cured. <laughs> but it's not all gloom and despondency. No, there's love and romance. And it all begins on the day in two months' time, the day on which you lose your virginity. Ah, Baddiel. Just, uh, you in detention today. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's your music teacher and the only one that at the moment you like and trust, Mr. Clulo. <laughs> but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Adopted as you were at the age of only two months, you finally discover on your deathbed exactly who your real father is. Now let me leave you with one final... <laughs> and welcome to Top of the Box with me, Gary Davis, and my eyebrows, which are shaped a bit like a crossword clue, one across. And if you've ever wondered what Gary's bit in the middle is, it's, it's this bit here. That, that's, the, that's the bit in the middle. And so it's time now for our first band, who are the other one from the Pet Shop Boys, the other one from Erasure, the fat bloke who used to be in Soft Cell, and that bloke with the funny moustache off of Sparks. <laughs> but uh, I've got to get my finger on this key. Well, I would, but I think I've got a fax coming through. <laughs> no! No! Well, what about him? Who? The bloke off of Sparks. <laughs> no, maybe not. <laughs> oh, come on, somebody's got to do it. Go on, go on. Go on. I could have done better than that. Yeah, chin rub. Oh, yeah. Chin rub, you you're, could. Us you're useless, you are useless. Are you all right? <laughs> are you warm enough? Do you need to go to the toilet? He's never right in this world, is he? Hang on, I, th I think I've got Moyer Anderson's phone number somewhere. <laughs> Idea. Wait, just, just hold on a minute, it's all right. Finish that off. I've got it. Right, listen, listen. I've got the lead man from a major band. He's going to come in front us, all right? So set yourselves up. It's going to be brilliant. <laughs> 